tell you a little bit about myself. Um, it's going to be hard to put me in a box. I, I'm not really what you would call a religious person by traditional definitions. I suppose I'm your local heretic, actually. But, um, I'm not a Republican, a Democrat, a Catholic, a Jew, a Muslim. I, I just haven't bought into any of those systems because I, I feel that once you're labeled, like people ask me sometimes, well, are you an atheist? No, I'm not an atheist because I do see that there's some kind of an underlying conscious principle that's manifesting through matter and reality. I think there's something else. But that's based upon research, experience, and some facts, not just faith. So that's me. And um, I'm going to have to scoot this along a little bit. So if it seems like I'm being a little rushed, you know, making itself more pronounced and forcing the more ancient religious concepts to sort of catch up. And here's a definition of belief or believe as I'm going to be using it today because we use, like, I believe in a better world. I, we use the same word for so many experiences. The definition of belief or believe as it is used today is the predisposition we have on our planet to pretend we know things that are in fact unknowable. And this dates back to the early times when our ancestors, I'm sure they had to make sense of their world and they did what they had to do based upon the knowledge that they had at the time. But now we have so much more knowledge. Definition of faith. When I use the word faith, or if it comes up, I mean faith as the license that some people have to just believe anything without any evidence whatsoever. And when it's based upon faith, we start stepping out into some pretty shaky ground because we had many, many people that believed the world was flat, totally based upon faith. So that's, but I, I'm not talking about the kind of faith we have in human nature and mankind and a better world. I'm not too sure we could live without that faith. But let's take a quick look at the power of beliefs that they have on us. And I'm talking about religious, political, national, and personal beliefs. just want you to sort of pretend like there's a, there's a one-ton diamond in your backyard. And what would it take for you to believe that? Like, what would it really take for you to believe that there's a one-ton diamond in your backyard? First of all, it needs to be what? Visible. Visible. Well, but there's no one-ton diamond. Then I don't believe it. Right. right. So what does it have to be? Faith. It has to be believable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the next question is, what is it going to take to make that believable? You're going to have to discount. And first of all, you're never going to have to doubt it. If you doubt it, it's going to crumble real quick. Hmm. You're going to have to discount everything that archaeology has ever accumulated. Mineralogy, there's never been a one-ton diamond. Four billion years of historical evidence, physics, I mean, what it even takes to make a diamond that big doesn't exist. All logic, common sense, and reasoning. Now I'm telling you, by the time you make yourself believe this unbelievable thing, you have limited your life, and it also affects the way you see everything else. And I'm sure we've seen this in um, people that we would call believers. This is me. And um, just think of the tragedy of not letting a kid doubt, you know, like giving them information and answers before they even ask the questions is I think someday we will look back at this and realize this is not the thing to do. You have to start that mental apparatus rolling and asking questions to do the logical function. But if you give a kid an answer too early, it stops that functioning. So what are the social consequences of belief systems in our history? That's the first part of my book. Well, we've all seen this, and it's probably ad nauseum. We, we hear about the Inquisition and all of this stuff so much that we don't even really pay attention to it anymore, but I think we need to because we're starting to get back into torture based upon 
the, the moral right to do so. And that moral right comes from our beliefs that somehow we have the moral right given to us by the divine creator of the universe. And the trouble is we have many different factions of this planet right now that feel that they have that divine sanction. Does anybody know about this guy? Giordano Bruno. Yeah. Well, he made the mistake of um, saying that the, the Earth revolved around the Sun. And the uh, Vatican called him before him and uh, said, no, 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 no. Sentenced him to six or seven years and then sentenced him. And when they sentenced him, it wasn't a very nice thing. And something that happened on the way there that a friend of mine told me about is when they were taking him there, he was, they had him in the back of the cart with the guards, and he was actually getting a following of people because everyone was saying, hey, wait a minute, we know that this is the truth. What, what are they going to kill you for? You know, and all these people were starting to follow him, so they stopped and pulled out his tongue, put a spike through it, drove spikes up through his jaw, oh. bent him over so he couldn't talk. Now, this is where our beliefs can take us, and it's, um, I mean, I can't even imagine something like that happening, let alone doing it to somebody. And this is a good example of the, the mob madness that's sanctioned by a God that only they can talk to. For some reason, nobody else can hear this God but them, and they say that God told them that they could do this. Now, I don't know if you know much about mob madness, but... If you've ever been in a situation that gets out of control, it, it sort of sucks your consciousness away. And a lot of people hide in a mob and do things that they wouldn't normally do. We used to hide in lynch mobs and things like that, but now we hide in churches and religions and corporations. I was watching a, a documentary on corporations and the CEOs were saying that they would never do some of the things that the corporation does but the corporation has a, a mind of its own, and they just sort of go along with it. But by themselves, they would never make some of those decisions, environmental decisions, financial. I mean, this could have happened to some poor woman just for cooking with some herbs. And I've heard people say that there's like a million, a hundred thousand, but actually there's only been about uh, 15,000 recorded witch burnings during those few centuries, but that's a lot. I mean, these were mothers and sisters and daughters. And if you think uh, the creativity was at a low time during this time, put that out of your mind. This is what they used to uh, have people sit in and start cranking it down until they finally believed what they wanted them to believe. And uh, I think all they'd have to do is just show it to me. I think, yeah, sure, I believe it. Get me out of this place. And the social implications of belief systems aren't limited to the past. I mean, we've all been living through this here recently. And um, there's no way you can pay people to do this. The only way you can get people to do something like this is guarantee them somehow through some kind of a belief that their reward comes in the next life. And consequently, most of the rewards for most of the religions on this planet comes in the next life. <laughs> Hmm. By odd coincidence. What started me uh, thinking about this was a quote by Voltaire, those who can make you believe in absurdities can make you commit atrocities. I started thinking, how could that possibly be? And there's a neurological similarity to both things. If you can get somebody to believe something absurd, like the one-ton diamond, the neurological detachment and breaking down of synapses and networking to do that is the same kind of neural networking it takes to make a person that easily manipulated into doing things that they wouldn't normally do. I don't know if you know this guy, but speaking of absurd and atrocities, uh, what, what's funny about him is Years ago, uh, Richard Dawkins, he's an Englishman, evolutionist, uh, biologist, and uh, he did a documentary called uh, The Root of All Evil. 
And during the documentary, he was documenting this guy and his following. He has 30 million people following him, 4,000 people in his church. He's heavy duty against homosexuality and drugs and all the things that preachers are against. And um, during the documentary, Richard Dawkins looks into the camera and says, doesn't anybody see that this guy is off of his mind? I mean, he's, he's completely insane. That was years. Years later, after 30 million people didn't see it, 4,000 people in his congregation, they caught him uh, with homosexuality, with his uh, little boys in his congregation. They busted him buying methamphetamine, and I won't even go into the details. Another lady here, Becky Fisher, I don't know if you've seen Jesus Camp, but this is what we're doing to our children. And it's happening today as we speak. And we really need to like wake up. Jesus Camp is this documentary. That they went out to make this documentary, and they thought that they were making it for a good reason. But actually, they were, weren't making it for a good reason. They were trying to expose them for what they're doing. And what they're doing is um, preparing the children for war. They're, by their own admission, they're preparing their kids and the kids that goes to Jesus camp to be good Christian soldiers. And in the documentary, Becky says, well, you know, the Muslims, they're really fanatical about this, and we're losing this race and fanaticism. We need to be more fanatical than they are. And I'm thinking, my gosh, you know, and people believe this stuff. And these are our kids. I mean, look at this little girl. Look at this. I mean, this little girl is not happy. I, I don't care what you tell me. She's not happy. And we're we're indoctrinating these kids at a really early age. And we can see other religions, like the, the Muslims or the Jewish people, how they sit and they read the Torah for hours and hours, and they, they get the young men in the Muslim religion, don't let them have sex, don't let them have sex all of their lives. And of course, you know, the promised 72 virgins, you know, they're going to be more easily manipulated. But we do the same thing to our kids. And if you think, I, I called him Amnesty International because I wanted to know what is going on right now. And they said, right now, it's the same old story. They said, at any one time, there's about 20 religious wars going on on the planet. These are some of them. At any one time, over a loving and compassionate God. And these are just some of what's happening right now in different countries, different religions. But my question is, who, who's paying for this insanity? Guess who's paying for this insanity? World War I, we had 10% of the casualties were innocent bystanders and, uh, what do they call it? Uh, collateral. Yeah, collateral damage. Collateral. You know, I don't know why they don't call it murder, but World War II, 20% was innocent civilians. Vietnam, 60%, and we thought that was really bad. I mean, now in Iraq, 90% are innocent civilians, so we're not even even if this was such a thing as a just war, we're not even killing the very people we're supposed to be killing. And right now they say there's about 150 of them in Afghanistan. So that's why we're there. Human beings have killed over 160 million other human beings in the last century alone. And contrary to what we're being told to believe today, you know, we always find out later that the war was started, manipulated, and controlled by banking interests, usually. And this dates back to the Revolutionary War. The Civil War was promoted by two banking interests. All of our wars have been started on a phony premise, like Pearl Harbor. They knew about two weeks before Pearl Harbor happened, they knew that the ships were coming, and they let it happen. Because there's a few of you in here that remember, but America did not want to go to their war. Mm -hmm. And they knew that's what it would take. And th this is a matter of record. I, I fact-checked everything that you're seeing here today, by the way. <clears throat> Some people tell me, well, this country was founded on Christian principles, and we need Christian principles embedded into our Congress. And this is just four quotes from uh, people like Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Benjamin Franklin. These people were Masonic people. They just came from a, a country, England, that had just been completely dominated by religious rules. And 
we had just come out of the dark ages because of religion. And they did not want religion to be part of our government. They, they made a, a separation there for reasons, and the reasons are showing themselves up today. Sometimes I ask myself, if I, was, if I was an alien, what would I be thinking about this planet? As near as I can tell, they're fighting over which religion is the most peaceful. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you were really looking from a detached point of view, and you had an expanded consciousness looking at this planet, we would look like we're insane. Mm -hmm. We go in and we bomb a country, then we go in and build it back up. Yeah. Rick Ray, he did a documentary called Ten Questions for the Dalai Lama. So I interviewed him because I wanted to know what the Dalai Lama said that wasn't allowed to be put on the interview. And the question I asked was, did, did you ask him about the Middle East? Like, what can we do about the, the conflict in the Middle East? I wanted to know what one of the most religious, spiritual, meditative, compassionate people on the planet would have to say. He says you can't do anything. He says, the most you can do is get these people together and don't let them talk. <laughs> because the moment they start talking, they, they start talking about their belief, and their belief dictates, it's a mandate from the supreme creator of the universe that they must go out and convert or remove from the planet the unbelievers, the infidels, whatever they're calling them at the time. That's not very encouraging, by the way. You know, I, I'm not too sure, like I'm going to be bringing up a lot of questions and a lot of problems, but I'm not too sure of some of the solutions. So here's my question to religious believers. Why do I believe what I believe and what gives me the authority and right to impose those beliefs on others, even if it risks the very planet that we all inhabit? And the reason this is here is because I was... Um, Bill Moyers was giving a speech one time, and he was talking about one of the congressmen getting up in Congress and making a speech about all the trees should be laid down and bare on the planet, and he was reading out of Revelations. And that's bad enough to be reading out of Scripture on the congressional floor. It's even worse to be reading out of it and saying that all the trees need to be laid bare, but what made it even worse is he was in charge of our forestry. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Sam Harris, he's a neuroscientist, he's done comparative religions, and he's doing a lot of functional MRI research right now. And some of the research I'm talking about comes from his work. We will have won this war of ideas against religion when atheism is scarcely intelligible as a concept. We will simply find ourselves in a world in which people cease to praise one another for pretending to know things they do not know. This is certainly a future worth fighting for. It may be the only future compatible with our long-term survival as a species. But the only path between now and then that I can see is for us to be rigorously honest in the present. It seems to me that in intellectual honesty is now and will always be deeper and more durable and more easily spread than atheism. And he's talking about, so there's a lot of anti-theist and atheistic movements. It's sort of, for me, it's like a knee-jerk kind of a response to the religious fundamentalism. And we have to be careful not to be just on the other side of this. So what about the neurological consequences of belief systems? And now we're getting into, like, everything else we've been looking at, the book goes into it in much greater detail, but the sociological consequences are pretty obvious. They're all around us, and it's just turn on the news. But what are the consequences, the neurological consequences? This is just coming out in the last few years. And these are some of the magazines and newspapers and articles that are starting to talk about this, the, the wars of religion, why do we believe? And all of these articles are coming out because of all of the science behind it, just saying one time after another that there's neurological damage being done by somebody that maintains a strict and rigorous belief system. That's why I wanted to interview uh, Dr. Andrew Newberg. He was in What to Believe and he was in um, Religious and he's a uh, neuroscientist. He's been doing a lot of work back east. One of the things he says is 
The brain is a stubborn organ. Once its primary set of beliefs has been established, the brain finds it difficult to integrate opposing beliefs and ideas. This has profound consequences for individuals and society and helps to explain why some people cannot abandon destructive beliefs, be they religious, political, or psychological. And what really attracted me to this guy, because I wanted to know if this was just a off-the-wall statement or what. Fundamentalism in and of itself <coughs> can be benign and personally beneficial, but the anger and prejudice generated by extreme beliefs can permanently damage your brain. So I, I wanted to know, well, what are you talking about, damaging your brain just by believing? He says what happens is to believe something that doesn't have evidence and it's not being processed in your the logical part of your mind, you have to start breaking down neural connections. And once you start that, you can get to a point where atrophy starts in. And when atrophy starts in, your brain actually starts to shrink and you start becoming, well, we have terms for it, tunnel vision, narrow-mindedness. It comes out through our language. We, we know that people that are extremely embedded into beliefs are very hard to talk to, unless you happen to believe like they do. And it's pretty easy. This was in a Newsweek magazine, and some of this uh, was uh, functional MRI work. Functional MRI is where they, you can take not just a snapshot of the brain, but you can actually see some of the processing going on, and you can see where the brain lights up with certain kinds of thoughts and beliefs. Our brain makes no distinction between the reality of math from a textbook or the information learned in Sunday school. This is important to realize, because this means that a believer believes in the second coming as a fact, because it is processed as a fact, even though it goes in as a belief, not based on fact, but on faith. And, and, and the final one here is when a religious belief is too absurd for the brain to process it through normal logical processing, it processes it through the emotional part of the brain. This is why we just feel like it's the truth. <coughs> if, if I give you uh, a completely absurd thought and I ask you to believe that thought and you try to force believe it through faith and just not through logic at all because there's no logic to it. Your brain has to process that information, and they're finding out that the brain starts sliding it back to the more emotional processing. So consequently, you end up not only believing it as a fact, you actually end up feeling it to be true because you emotionally process that. So now you just feel it's true. You feel it in your heart of hearts, and you know, I just know this is the truth. Is that the reptilian part of the brain? Um, Probably the amygdala. No, it's, it's in the emotional okay. processing. Okay. Heart math, I interviewed this guy, uh, Roland McCready. Attentional blindness is a way of showing that we literally only perceive what we pay attention to, which is what we believe to be true. Most of the information is filtered out. I mean, I, I forget the exact amount of bits of information, but what we filter out comes down to a tiny, tiny sliver of information and we usually filter out everything that goes against previously held beliefs. He told me they made a uh, little documentary video, and what they did was they had a basketball court with five or six basketball players bouncing one ball back, back and forth to each other, and they told an audience of about 100 people, count the basketball bounces. That's all we want you to do, just count the bounces. So they sat there and they counted the bounces, and. After they turned the video off, the researcher said, well, how many bounces were there? And they all were pretty close because they were paying attention. Their attention was on the bouncing. And he said, well, did you see anything else? They said, no. They said, did you not see that there was a man in a gorilla suit running through the basketball court? And none of them believed that that was the truth. They had to play it again to go, oh my gosh, you know. So we do filter out a lot of information. And this is why we usually run up and hang around people that sort of support our beliefs. What, what, if, what, what do you have a question? Um, well, you, you were trying to get the information on how many bits of information we process. The number was either in the millions or billions, and what we're aware of was a couple thousand. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's dramatically less. I saw that video and I didn't see the gorilla. See, your attention was on the bounces. 
Candace Perth, uh, she wrote Molecules of Emotion, and one of the things she brings up is that <clears throat> for every emotion, for especially emotions, when we have an emotion, like if I laugh, I'm going to produce interleukin-2, which is the first line of defense against cancer. Uh, if I feel tranquil, I'm going to produce benzodiazepine. You know, it's, there's a chemical counterpart to every emotion. If the chemical comes first, here comes the emotion. If the emotion comes first, here comes the chemical. Where this gets a little touchy is because we get so fanatic about our fundamentalism, especially in religious beliefs and political beliefs, that we actually create an emotional chemical soup of peptides and hormones. Now what happens is those chemicals plug into the receptors, the opiate receptors of the cell wall. And then what happens as the cell reproduces and divides, the new cells have even more opiate receptors wanting those chemicals. So we actually set up a system to where we're not only getting addicted, but we're, we're making it to where we want that feeling even more. So we have to be careful, like I'm sure you've seen in What the Bleep they talked about people that are always feeling, oh, this always happens to me, poor, poor, pitiful me. But what happens is since 95% of our unconscious is what manifests our world, we go around creating situations that will produce that kind of a situation to make us feel sorry for ourselves. So we also have to be careful of the uh, chemical aspects of beliefs. Fanaticism. Yep. Bruce Lipton, even if your beliefs are in your conscious mind, it still never changes the program in your subconscious mind. The dangerous thing is that the tape is being programmed by other people's behavior and it's not even known to us in our consciousness. So what they're finding out right now is that we, we have a field that permeates and goes out through, from our body and they're pretty sure that the information is not held in the mind but it's held in that field. And so when we're close to people, their field of energy and their beliefs, their thoughts, their fears, everything is being forced into our field of energy also, which is information being shared. So, be careful who you hug, I guess. Bruce Lipton, he's a, he's a really interesting guy. He was one of the microbiologists right on the pioneering front lines of actually bringing about the fact that we're not dictated to by just our genetics. We, our cell membrane is actually picking up lots of influences and there's hope for us. In other words, we're not just destined to be who we are. Joe Dispenza, what the brain likes to do is simply replace old beliefs with new ones. So why and how does this happen? That, that's, that's really the question in the neurological. Our brains are on autopilot most of the time. Researchers have shown that our brains cheat when learning, switching to automatic pilot mode whenever it's possible. Instead of trying to answer a question by reasoning, our brain explores the catalog of previous answers to similar questions to save time and to avoid thinking. This is one of the dangers of an entrenched belief system because they create limited neural networks that inhibit the rational thinking process. And I'm sure we've all had experience with people in this category. Are you, are you commingling the idea of the mind along with the brain? Yeah. That they're both the same? In some aspects. It's an easy matter to see that our outer world is a reflection of our inner world. Wouldn't it be wise to catch any dysfunctions we may have in our neurological networking before we manifest those functions in the outer world? And, and what I'm trying to say here is, if we have a dysfunction in our thinking process, we need to start thinking about it because we end up manifesting what we are inside out there be it communication, how we handle people, how we deal with life. How we proceed and judge. Yep. This is something I, I have to measure this every three or four months just to see if it's really true. But these tables are exactly the same. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up is it's because neurologically we are hardwired to set in perspective the idea of vanishing points and we see things a certain way. No matter what they are out there, by the time they get in here, they're different. This, for instance, there, there's no straight lines. I mean, 
There's all straight lines there. There's no crooked lines. But yet our mind has to see crooked lines because that's how the information is being input. I'm sure we've all seen this, the FedEx side. <clears throat> You'd be surprised how many people have never seen the arrow. And the important aspect of this seeing the arrow is once you see the arrow, it, point, it pops out at you. It becomes in the foreground and everything else becomes the background. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because... Show us. <laughs> what arrow? Oh, between the X. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now you watch. Every time you see a FedEx truck now, it'll be different. And my point here is, is once you start seeing what's really behind the crooked politician, the, the warped preacher, the professor that's professing age-old science that don't exist anymore, the newscaster that's giving you a bunch of ridiculous lies, once you start seeing this, you start seeing it all the time. And you start seeing through this. Because your mind, once it makes that shift, it's on. It's hard to fool you after a while. This is something I, I, I've uh, talked to a lot of religious people in the process of writing this book. Something I ask them is, but how can you be sure it's the Word of God? Well, because the Bible tells us so. Well, but why believe the Bible? Well, the Bible's infallible. Well, but how do you know it's infallible? Well, the Bible's the Word of God. <laughs> and we don't see the cycle that we get ourselves locked into that's supporting itself. And it, it starts cutting us off from outside information. So here's the question. Like, do you want the red pill or the, the, the blue pill? You know, so many people simply don't want to wake up. They don't want to know. And without the desire to know, everything I'm telling you right now, isn't going to matter at all. You have to desire to break free from how you see this life and the illusion that we're deeply embedded into. I'm going to have, there's a, there's going to be like about a three and a half minute talk here by um, Eckhart Tolle that talks about beliefs too. Pretty soon. When it comes up, he just starts playing. But this is what this is really about. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear as it is, infinite. And that's actually what I'm talking I'm not talking about giving you something else to believe in. I, I'm talking about clearing the doors of perception because until you start seeing life the way it is, it's meaningless. How can we possibly have any meaning from somebody that may or may not have had an experience 4,000 years ago by a burning bush? It would be like trying to get nourishment out of a meal that somebody ate 20 years ago because they told us about it. It's not going to happen. We have to have our own experience. And to have that, we, we have to start clearing away the indoctrination and the doors have to be cleansed. One way to do this is uh, Don Miguel Ruiz, he wrote The Four Agreements. And he says, be impeccable with your word, which is what I'm doing my best to be here today with you. Don't take anything personal, which is, uh, I hope, what you all are doing. And don't make assumptions. And always do your best. But something else he says in the book is, don't believe anything. The moment you, if, if anything that I'm saying, if you say to yourself, yeah, I believe that, and just don't think about it anymore, it's not going to do you any good. You, you have to validate everything that comes in. Here's the the enormous amount of data, there's also pain that you... thing about that is that we get so identified with our beliefs. I am a Republican. I am a Christian. I am a Jew. We are human beings, and these are just labels that we get identified with. <clears throat> Osho, most of you probably know him as Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, and probably all you heard was propaganda pumped out by the Reagan machine, but he brings up something. There are two types of evolution, collective evolution and individual conscious evolution. Evolution implies unconscious collective progress. In other words, it pretty much happens by itself and we're part of that. So it would be better to use the word revolution in talking about man. With man, revolution becomes possible. Revolution, as I am using the word here, means a conscious individual effort towards evolution. 
it is bringing individual responsibility to a peak. Only you are responsible for your evolution. A rabbi, a priest, nobody's going to, a guru, a master, they're not going to be able to help you until you start helping yourself. This isn't a personal path that we're on. We're so used to giving our responsibility away to other people that we fall into a trap once in a while. And the thing for me that comes to mind is evolution has been more or less the evolution of consciousness up to this point, and we'll get into this in a second. But now it's become a conscious evolution because we are now participants in our own evolution. The moment we gain self-reflective consciousness, we change the game. And that's the good news and the bad. Well, anything, any, anything, any, anything anyone says or that you experience is just, is just information. Only until you as a person gives it, give it meaning. Right. Identify. Then you're making it either belief or knowledge within yourself. Yep. So you have a choice of making your brain like an etch sketch where you can just keep it clear. Yep. The beginner's mind, as they say in Buddhism. So if our consciousness is evolving, what does that mean to us at, at this particular point in time? If, if consciousness is evolving, what's the what's the big what's the big deal right now? Well, I'm sure a lot of you know this gentleman. Uh, Teilhard Chardin, and many visionaries have spoke of convergence of mankind culminating in the end of time and reality as we know it. And I'm not talking about the religious apocalyptic end. There's a, a convergence, a merging, that people like uh, Thomas Lewis talked about in the lives of cells, Ken Carey talks about the star seed transmissions, and many, many visionaries have looked forward even centuries ago and seen that we're heading towards a time of convergence, and we don't quite know how to label that. Christians call it the second coming, being one in the body of Christ, and every religion has their feelings about this. And in my book, I, there's about 15 different cultures, indigenous and otherwise, that have pointed to the same thing happening right about this time. Peter Russell, he, he wrote a book called The uh, Global Brain. He does a great, uh, if you ever go to his website, I really highly suggest getting this uh, global brain. But <clears throat> when he speaks about the global brain, you hear people talking about planetary consciousness, the global brain. Well, exactly what do they mean? Here's what they're talking about. Assuming that the Big Bang is somewhat correct. I mean, that's just another theory that we're working on. It's sort of holding its own right now. But assuming that's correct, at the, at the very beginning of the Big Bang, things were so dense and so hot that subatomic particles was the only thing that could exist. It was so hot that even atoms couldn't exist. But early, early on, we seen something happen. As things started to cool down and expand out, a pattern emerged. And that pattern was some of these subatomic particles making a slightly higher complex unit and making atoms, forming atoms. Then what happened, as things kept evolving out, there, this underlying pattern of whatever it is that's life, call it God or whatever, but there seems to be this pattern that keeps emerging through matter, the fields of matter, and pulling together smaller units into larger units, into more complex units, that sense the world and the reality a little bit more so that the atoms came together and formed molecules and when there was enough molecules somehow they came together I mean something's doing this I mean it doesn't just you don't just throw it into a tub and swish it up there's some kind of a pattern in life that's pulling things together into more complex forms of being and it takes so many cells to come together and make some of the first organisms and as organisms the very first ones manifested, they've been evolving ever since. Until today, you know, there's some pretty complex beings on this planet. And um, we happen to be one of them. So, <clears throat> the question is, if, if the pattern or matrix of life is still at work, where are we going from here? What, what is the next step if, if all of this came about? Let's just go over it real quick. Subatomic particles were first. They form together 
to make atoms. Atoms form together to make molecules. Molecules form together to make cells. And when enough cells form together to make organisms, we've evolved to this point now. And, and this is a building block. So many of this makes this, so many of this makes this. Now here we are, we're organisms. So what now? The, the next step would be a planetary or global <coughs> consciousness where as planetary cells, we're going to start energetically connecting, which I think we already are. And we've already manifested this out into our world as UPS, the post office, the internet. It's already showing itself in our material world, but it's actually a manifestation of what's happening on a, on a deeper conscious spiritual level. But what could stop this process, or at least hinder it? I don't think we can stop it. We could choose not to be part of it, which we might. I mean, th this could happen. But what would stop this is having all of the, the beliefs, the divisive beliefs, the, the way we divide countries up into nations and religion. There's over 6,000 Protestant religions. My gosh, you know? That alone should tell us that something is wrong with the premise there. Do we have time for me to go into the part three? Yes. Yeah, go. Okay. Go. Okay, part three is, I, I had some trepidation about even putting this information in the book, and because the more I talk to uh, biblical scholars and archaeologists, I say, why don't you guys talk about this? They say, well, it discredits us. Because there's a thing in at the academic field where if you get discredited, I mean, imagine going into archaeology and you're saying you're going to study the Sumerian culture and extraterrestrials. You wouldn't even get out of school. Mm -hmm. and, and if you are an archaeologist and that is your direction, it's hard to get grants and funding. And when you put something like this in a book, which I might find out, but when you put something like this in a book, it, it's just too much for some people to grasp, to put your mind around it. So we're going to try to put our minds around it right now. So the evolution of us is somewhat correct up to a certain point. And I, I hear this over and over and over. I talked to Amit Goswami about this. What happens is the evolutionary theory seems to be correct somewhat, but there is a, there's a gap there. They call it the missing link. And they say that someday they'll find that link and they'll prove evolution is complete. But it's that at that missing link that the intelligent design people come in and say, aha, this had to be God. God had to uh, come in here and do this for us. But what if there's something else? What, what if evolution and intelligent design are both false and both correct all at the same time? Monsignor Corrado Balducci, he's a... Uh, a member of the Curia of the Roman Catholic Church, a prelate of the Congressional Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples and the Propagation of the Faith, leading exorcist of the Archdiocese of Rome, a member of the Vatican's Beautification Committee, an expert on demonology, author of several books, appointed in the Vatican, appointed in the Vatican to deal with the issue of UFOs, extraterrestrials, but probably his most important redeeming quality as far as I'm concerned is he was close friends with the last Pope and this Pope. He recently died this year. But um, everything that he has said has been silently sanctioned by the church. And he had a meeting with this guy. I don't know if you know about Zachariah Sitchin, but uh, he's the author of uh, Earth Chronicles. He has a couple of really nice books out just, just recently too. Sitchin attributes the creation of the ancient Sumerian culture to the Anunnaki or the Nephilim, a race of aliens from a planet called Nibiru, which is said to have an elongated elliptical 3600 year orbit in the Earth's own solar system. He is a linguist and a Hebrew scholar. I mean, this guy knows his stuff. And he got the, together with the Monsignor. And, I mean, what do you think these two people could possibly agree on? Well, they agreed on three things for sure. I mean, th this had to be, this is something from Zachariah Sitchin. And what, what must have been a historical first, a high official of the Vatican and a Hebrew scholar discussed the issue of extraterrestrials and the creation of man. And through different, from, and though different from each other in upbringing, background, religion, methodology, 
nevertheless arrive at some conclusions. Yes, extraterrestrials can and do exist on other planets. Yes, they can be more advanced than us. And yes, materially, man could have been fashioned from a pre-existing sentient being. I mean, that third one is the <coughs> clincher. If you don't, if you've ever read Genesis, that pretty much does away with Genesis and the whole idea of, of God coming down and magically forming us from mud. These are the Anunnakis, the ancient Anunnaki gods. They're often depicted with wings. And this is what they're talking about. The Anunnakis, Anunnaki stands for those who came down from above. And we're finding these clay tablets and, and plates and pictographs all over Iraq. And it's sort of interesting because I was watching a documentary and one of the first things our soldiers did when we went to Iraq was they blew the doors off the museums and left. Wow. They, they guarded the, the oil rigs and all that, but they left the museums to be plundered. They left the, um, the nuclear fusion plant, fission plant to be plundered and the water's all has radioactive water all over the place now. But they didn't pay any attention to the museum. <coughs> and consequently, all this stuff was lost. Fortunately, we have a lot of people that took pictures of stuff. This is one of, one of the mysteries of how drawings were accomplished deep inside caves and pyramids was how did they do it because there's no carbon, there's no smoke. How did they get light down there? They tried to do it with mirrors, but the angle doesn't work out right. And some people say that this is a, a big light bulb here, up in the upper left-hand corner. And on this bottom one here, that's an Anunnaki sitting down. And notice how much bigger he is. And remember the, the, uh, the things in the Bible where they talked about there were giants in those days. And notice the planetary um, thing right here. This, this is the sun and all the planets, plus the extra planet of uh, Nibiru. I mean, how did they know about this stuff? The, the Anunnaki's knew about the procession of the equinox, and to even have an idea that the Earth has a procession, you have to methodically look at the sky, the night sky, for over 2,000 years, and take exact measurements. And there was no culture that we know of that did that. So that the all the indigenous peoples, the Mayans, and all the people that have this information, they had to get it from somewhere. Here's another one where it's, uh, they're often depicted with uh, flying discs. And here's some more things that they found. They're, they're all, almost always depicted with some kind of wings. And we have to remember, when we say the eagle was landed, we're not talking about a real eagle. I mean, these are uh, pictures that people were trying to do at the time to make the best sense out of what was going on. And this is, um, you know, from the Aztecs or Mayans. And this, I have notes here somewhere. But this is from the Aborigines. And uh, this is from photos from... Ecuador, and this see how similar these two things. And this is a real astronaut. These are things that they're finding. I mean, where do these people get all this? And these are ancient uh, alien figurines. I mean, it doesn't take much of uh, imagination to see that these are pretty close to what people say that they're seeing today. Of course, we know about the face on Mars, and on Mars, there's five pointed pyramids, and it's the only place, the only planet that we know of that has naturally formed five-sided pyramids. Whether it's real or not, we don't know because NASA has this habit of uh, overlooking, taking pictures again. England, Brazil, France, Spain, Belgium, and Mexico are just a few of the countries that have opened up their UFO files, yet the United States still says they know nothing about UFOs. I mean, how can that possibly be that every other country knows that there's UFOs, like if you go down to Brazil where my wife lives, and you say, do you believe in UFOs? They look at you like you're a moron. Like, well, yeah, you know, my uncle seen one, my dad, I seen one. There, there's like thousands of videos and pictures. It's just, and some of these are from NASA. 
And I think probably you guys know this guy, uh, Dr. Andrew Mitchell. Alien is something he said. He, he was the Apollo 14 um, astronaut. And he, I think he's known for taking the longest moonwalk or something. But he says, aliens have contacted humans several times, and it's been covered up by our governments for the last 60 years or so. But slowly it's leaked out, and some of us have been privileged to have been briefed on some of it. And I, I don't know if you've ever met him or um, listened to him speak, but I, I have a lot of confidence. I, I feel really confident that he would not BS us. I mean, it would just be so against everything he believes in. And, and he even talked to a high-up official about Roswell, and they said Roswell did happen, and it was covered up. Here's another uh, ancient aliens and the similarity to what's been going on more recently. This is, uh, this is from 5500 BC in uh, Utah. These are by some Aborigines, and they call them the, I don't know how to pronounce it, the Wajina, I think. And again, the similarity is just too strong. This is from a 10th century Tibet translation of the Sanskrit text Prajna Paramahita Sutra. And some people say, well, those are hats, but if they're hats, you know, why are they floating in the air? <laughs> this is from the Ramayana. The Ramayana and the Mahabharata are, are sacred Indian texts, and there's so much information in there. And I, I talked with uh, uh, Swami Kriyananda about this. And it's pretty interesting because they go into detail about Vimanas, which are their word for UFOs. And they explain them in detail. They even talk about they had a, something that appears like it was a nuclear war. They had a disagreement. And that shows up on, in other cultures, too. And, of course, the Renaissance. There's so much Renaissance art out there where people at that time, they were seeing things way back then. This is from a, it's a couple of crusaders from a 12th century manuscript. I mean, this one guy, he's, he's pointing to a, something flying in the air. And as you know, nothing flew in the air in the 12th century. Mm -hmm. This is a painting. Notice here the, the ship. This is a blow-up. It's sending a beam of light into Mary's third eye. Madonna, again, you know, this is the picture. It's blown up here. Notice down here there's a, there's a man and a dog looking up at this. You know, the painter is trying to tell us something here, that they were seeing things back in those days, and they were sneaking them in to religious artifacts. As you, you probably know that most of the sculptors and painters of the great religious um, pieces of art weren't totally just into the religion. They were into other things, too. Here's another one. This is a, a blow-up of here, and this is a blow-up of here. And, you know, he's definitely looking back at somebody chasing him. And there's, there's so many of these that I mean, we can make a whole workshop just on uh, pieces of art. This one, there, there's so many ships at sea that in their logs they talk about seeing lights and flying vehicles and um, vehicles that actually came down from the ocean. Isn't that one on the on the ceiling of the Vatican, the second top on, on the top corner? I, the I think so. Corner, I think the so. Green ball. Yeah, I think so. And it looks like he has an antenna there. It looks yeah, like he's listening to the radio. It's on the, the ceiling yeah. of the Vatican. Yeah. And here's just some interesting things that probably most of you know, but, you know, a 400 ton rock, there's no crane on earth that could lift this rock, let alone drag it five miles, and you can't even hardly grow food up here. I mean, how did these rocks get here in the quarry five miles away? And, you know, archaeologists, it's a strange thing, too, because up until recently, all of the archaeologists have either been Muslims, Jews, or Christians, and so many of those believe the world was six to 10,000 years old based upon uh, Usher. Usher did this thing of all the begats and it started on January 9th at 9 a.m. I guess Eastern time or 
<laughs> and those screws in the rock are, they don't even know how that could happen. The technology today would be hard for it to match those screws because those, those grooves that are cut in the rock are laser straight. Right. And they're, and they're the exact depth all the way across. So how did that machining process take place back then? And then these rocks were just scattered like... Yeah, it's a scattered. Like some force that just moved them, and, and there's, no, there's no crane that can exist that today that can lift it. You have to ask why, even though you can't how? get an answer. Yeah. yeah, how? The Nazca lines, you can't see that too clear, but obviously these lines, I, I flew over this, and it's, it's real obvious that no one went to this extreme to make these lines for people on the ground. This is interesting too, because Edgar Casey predicted that we would find the Hall of Records when the right arm of the Sphinx falls off. And Awas, the guy that controls all this, see all this scaffolding up here? They're doing everything they can to keep that arm on. And it makes me wonder if they haven't already gone down and seen what was going on. But it's my guess that when they find the, the records of mankind down there, it's going to change everything. The Bible actually is one of the best places I went to uh, to look for some of this stuff, especially the book of Enoch. If you've never, if never read the book of Enoch, it's really revealing because Enoch was taken up into heaven and he was told to write down everything that he's seen, and, but he was also told that nobody's going to quite understand this. And he, was, he was given a magic uh, implement to write with, I don't know, a pen or something. And he came down and wrote all these books, and uh, for some reason the church left him out because actually he gets very specific about even going to what we would call the flight deck of the UFO. He came back and told people, he says, hey, that sun, it's a star, but it's close up. And he says, there's many, many other planets out there. They, they actually took him around to where he could see it. He came back and wrote all this stuff down. And if you read the book of Enoch, it's really revealing that he took a space trip. He met the captain and called him the, the highest of the holies or something, but you know, what could they do? Enoch was taken up to heaven, stands before the throne of God, and goes through an amazing transformation. And who knows what um, advanced beings could be able to do to us if they focused on us and could do something with us energetically. Then you read in Genesis where the sons of God saw the daughters of men to be fair and took them to be wives, whomever they chose, which actually tells you that there was no asking. They just said, you, come here. And my question, when I was a little kid, when I heard this, I was eight years old, I thought, well, that's interesting. Who's the sons of God? I mean, and why is God having sons and who's the daughters of men? I mean, it didn't make sense. And nobody could answer that. And you still have it. In fact, I had to go out and get my own answers. Of course, everybody knows about Ezekiel. Just pick up a Bible and open the, the first few pages of Ezekiel. It's written that a great thundercloud flying craft came out of the north. The center was illuminated and like polished metal and shaped like a wheel that was spinning. In today's modern era, this would surely be written as an encounter with an unidentified flying object and extraterrestrials. As he said, four man-like beings came out of the craft. Elijah was taken off into heaven. And something interesting about the Bible is when you look into the original, if you, if you get a strong concordance, you can do this. But look at some of the original uh, meanings of some of the words. Like when they, it's time, like we upgrade our idea and our image of this God that we've been sort of stuck with since uh, the Iron Age. All of these beliefs date back to the Iron Age, believe it or not, from Israelite tribes that supposedly uh, were inspired by the creator of the universe. I'm not going to have time to go into that, but it's an interesting story, what I think is going to happen there. <clears throat> Here's some of the people, I'm just going to run through this real quick so we have some time here. These are some of the people that I've interviewed, what they had to say about beliefs. Timothy Freak, he wrote me a really nice uh, review too. 
I think we are waking up to oneness in many ways. We have a growing recognition that we are on one planet and we are one species. And I have always felt that the outer world has gone through some sort of collective denial. And they always seem to be going about as if they had signed up to some agreement, which was that no one knew what the hell was going on, but just not admitting it. <laughs> I mean, don't you think it's strange that we wake up on a planet with almost 7 billion people, and hardly anybody here knows what's going on, but we all sort of pretend like we do, or we don't think about it? Uh, Gary Zukov. I am referring to an evolutionary shift that is changing the human species from what it has been since its origin until very recently into something that is unprecedented with a potential that did not previously exist. <clears throat> if you ever get a chance to read The Dancing Wu Lee Masters, it's a great book. Neil Donald Walsh, he's sort of a character in Conversations with God, which makes me sort of suspicious, but I, I do like his information. and. Something I did in this book, I, I didn't just interview people that I agreed with. Like, I, I didn't agree with Immaculate totally. I didn't agree with Byron Katie completely. But something struck something in me that I knew I had to look, to look at, and they had something important to say. But he says, we're all going through a technological adolescence, and we're going through a theological infancy. The difficulty is our technology and science has outrun our theological advances. The reason for that is in technology and science, we have had the courage to ask the single question that theology has been afraid to ask. Is it possible that there's something I don't know about this, the knowing of which would change everything? See, in science, we have peer reviews. We have all kinds of systems set in place to keep us from being self-deceptive and just wishful thinking. Dr. Emoto, of course you know him, he's, he's done a lot of uh, research with water. And the thing is, is if motions and thoughts can make changes in the water outside of our bodies, then what can it do since, since we're mostly water? What does it do to us when we have harboring anger or feelings that we're somehow special and chosen by God and taking that out into the world and with all the conflict that comes at us? Lynn McTaggart. She, she wrote a book called The Intention Experiment in the Field, and she's interviewed a lot of interesting people, and in my book she has a lot of interesting things to uh, bring to the table as far as actual research using uh, random event generators and things like that that's happening. Amit Goswami, another character. Uh, how do you get out of a belief system? <clears throat> that was my question to him. First, you have to destruct the belief system. Traditionally, the teacher is supposed to remove your ignorance. But when you remove ignorance, you start with removing what is causing the ignorance, which is your belief system. So the teacher's job, indeed, is to first deconstruct your belief system, and then to give you inspiration so you'll go out and create a path to discover what is spirit, what is beauty, what is love, because these things nobody can teach you. So teaching really should be a demolition job. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what I'm doing today. I'm not trying to give you anything. I'm, I'm actually trying to take something away from you and demolish a little bit of what you have so you can see a little bit clearer what's being said out there in the world today. Another character. Um, first thing we need to do is realize that some of our old beliefs are dysfunctional and no longer work, if indeed they ever did. If the desire to do that isn't there, there's nothing to do. This is where personal desire comes in, personal commitment. Like it's going to be easy just to leave here today, go home and carry on with your lives and not give too much thought to this. But I suggest you do. Swami Kriyananda, he was really crucial to understanding some of the Vedic literature that's in my book about extraterrestrials and ancient civilizations. He's a, a master at the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. Byron Katie, she does a thing called the work, and the first thing she tells you to ask yourself, is it true? I, I mean, so many people have beliefs about themselves. Oh, I'm a loser. You say, well, do you really believe that? And, well, not really, but you, know, you just have to ask yourself, is it really true? And a lot of things her and I, we, we didn't really agree on, but she really made me think. And, and that's the whole point, is to think. And I might end up thinking like her, or I might not, but the point is I'm thinking. You have to get people thinking, and you have to... Question. 
get with people that don't agree with you. You set the question. Yeah. And Dan Millman, he, he talks about his experience with uh, Socrates. I don't know if you've read The uh, Peaceful Warrior or not. But he has some interesting things to say about beliefs, too. And like I say, it's in the book. Immaculate. I really wanted to, after I seen her on 60 Minutes and Oprah and listening to her story, she was a Rwanda survivor. And the uh, Hutus killed her whole family, her brother, her friends, her neighbors. And she was in, locked in the bathroom for uh, about three months with, I think, nine other women. And during that time, she said she went through a thing trying to figure out how in this world could she destroy these aggressors, like bombing them, cutting them up in little pieces. And she says for weeks, she just went through this like bombardment of terrible ideas and hate. And she realized that she can't live that way. And she realized she needs to figure out a way to forgive these people for herself. And that's the reason I wanted to interview her. I, I wanted to see, I mean, if somebody cuts me off in traffic, I have a hard time sometimes, <laughs> let alone if they killed my whole family. I wanted to know how in this world did she process those, that anger? Because if we don't learn how to process our anger and our vengeance and our aggression, and because there's, if you trace back, like, just take the Middle East, for instance. What's going on with Palestinian people and the Israeli people? I've asked so many people, even them, and they don't know. But where this comes from is a long time ago, there was this guy named Abraham that almost cut up his son because he thought God told him to. He had a maid called Hagar. And he slipped off in the back 40 with Hagar and had a child. And his wife, Sarah, got totally outrageous about it. She supposedly called God up and said, hey, we, we got to do something about Hagar and his offspring. And God says, well, take them out into the back country and we'll just let them die. So she did. They took them out in the back country to die, but they didn't die. And, of course, the kid grew up and had babies, and that's the Arab people. So the Arabs say, hey, we have uh, something coming here. You know, God promised us this property because our father is Abraham. But the Israelites say, no, you're bastard children. You, know, you don't have nothing coming, legal or otherwise. And that's what started this conflict, and it just keeps on going. Bill Moyers calls it the longest running family feud in history. <laughs> and until those people learn how to forgive each other and forget this nonsense, I I'm not too sure it's going to work. They're, they're going to continually fight. And I'm sure you know Carl Sagan. This is something that Carl Sagan says. Fundamental changes in society are sometimes labeled impractical or contrary to human nature, as if nuclear war were practical or as if there were only one human nature. But fundamental changes can clearly be made. We are surrounded by them. In the, in the last two centuries, abject slavery, which was with us for thousands of years, has almost been entirely eliminated in a stirring worldwide revolution. Women systematically mistreated for millennia are gradually, notice I say gradually, gaining the political and economic power traditionally denied to them. And some wars of aggression have recently been stopped or curtailed because of a revulsion felt by the people in the aggressor nations. The old appeals to racial, sexual, and religious chauvinism and to rabid nationalism are beginning not to work. A new consciousness is developing which sees the earth as a single organism and recognizes that an organism at war with itself is doomed. We are one planet. <laughs>